Welcome back, everybody, to another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. We are very happy to have Loretta Mester with us from the Cleveland Fed, the president of the Cleveland Fed. Hi, Loretta. Hi, Marcus. Glad to be with you. Glad to have you. And Loretta will talk about a diligent return to price stability. And we will have a little introduction, and then I will announce the poll answers you gave us. So thanks for participating. And then we have a discussion after Loretta's presentation about the various topics and the topics we want to cover, among other things, about talking about the inflation anchor, is it wobbly or not? What about the labor market? We have a very tight labor market, but you know, GDP output gap is less dramatic. Then about monetary policy, of course, um, and talking about the real interest rate, you know, we hiked a lot the nominal interest rate. How much does the real interest rate go up? Quantitative tightening and the flexible average inflation targeting framework. Are we returning to the flexible average inflation targeting framework or not? Then we talk about fiscal and monetary interaction. And also perhaps at the end, if there's time, a little bit about international impact of the US monetary policy. So let me jump uh, directly to the poll questions. So the poll questions we asked you and uh, you answered very nicely. The first question was, if the inflation anchor breaks, will it break smoothly or you know, continuously or will it break discontinuously? So that means if once you lose the inflation anchor, it's very hard to bring it back. And actually 27% said it's smoothly or continuously and 75% or 73% said uh, it's discontinuous. The second topic is on the labor market tightness is why is the labor market so tight? Is it a temporary phenomenon? Because labor productivity is actually went down. Is it a temporary thing? That's uh, what 36% uh, what thought. Or is it a permanent decline in labor market productivity? That's what 17% thought. And or is it a change in workers' preferences, working from home and you know, workers have a totally different preferences. We have to figure out how to rearrange our production processes. That's what 47% thought. So the majority actually of almost 50% said it's a change in workers' preferences. And then it has different implications for welfare. You know, even if it's less productive, they get perhaps more pleasure, more welfare out of that. Thirdly, the third question was about monetary policy. Where will we aim to go to once we go back to a lower inflation environment? Are we going back to a 2% inflation in target? Or do we go back to a flexible average inflation targeting framework as the Fed announced in August 2020? And so 57% said we're going back to 2% inflation. And 26% uh, said we go to back to flexible average inflation targeting, or we're going back to a framework where there's a higher inflation target than 2%. That's what 17% thought. And finally, about the fiscal implication, what is driving monetary policy, fiscal and monetary, the interaction, and to what extent will the Inflation Reduction Act really impact inflation and lower inflation? And actually, you know, only 23% said the Inflation Reduction Act will really lower inflation. And 77% thought it will you know, be something else. Probably the Fed will lower the inflation um, because the Inflation Reduction Act might be much more about environmental policies and industrial policy uh, than actually about inflation itself. So with this opening remarks and a reaction, how people think in the audience, how the audience thinks, I will pass on the, uh, this, the floor or the digital floor to Loretta who will explain to us, gives us a little bit of an outlook of the economy and uh, you know what the thinking is at the FOMC and what the Fed is thinking, how to bring inflation back down. And we saw today's numbers, it's coming down at least a little bit, uh, but hopefully it will go down persistently back to 2% in a very smooth way. Thanks a lot, Loretta. We're looking forward to your uh, presentation now. Well, thanks, Marcus. I, I really... Um... It's a real honor to be here. I listen to your webcast, so it's really a treat for me to actually be on the webcast today. So I, I really like the invitation. And although you said I'm going to explain the thinking of the FOMC, I just want to let people know that I'm presenting my own views, not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve System or my colleagues in the Federal Open Market Committee. But I will explain some of the, what we've done our, in our policy decisions um, to date. So last week we met. Um, and we raised the target range of the Fed funds rate by another 75 basis points. And the range now is three and three quarter to 4%. Um, and we also indicated that we anticipate that there, we're gonna have ongoing increases in the target range 
um, in order to attain a monetary policy stance that's sufficiently restricted to return inflation to 2%. And you know, if you look at the level and persistence of inflation, that journey back to 2% inflation is, is likely going to take some time. Um, the other thing we're doing at the FOMC is we're continuing the process of reducing the size of our balance sheet by allowing assets to roll off. And that also helps to firm the stance of monetary policy. So what I thought I'd do is I share a couple of slides um, to walk through um, kind of the outlook and perhaps uh, this will be helpful for people to sort of understand kind of where we're coming from. So let's see if that worked. Um, can people see those? Yes, perfect. Oh, excellent. Okay. So, right, last week was the fourth 75 basis point increase in as many meetings. And then the funds rate target is now 375 basis points higher than it was at the start of the year. So compared to history, that's a pretty rapid pace of increases in our policy rate. But I, I also want to sort of put that in context because compared to history, the economy is experiencing really high and really persistent inflation. And the real policy rate is just beginning to move into restrictive territory. Um, of course, there's more than just the Fed funds rate that matters for the economy. If you look at overall financial conditions, they're tighter than at the start of the year. Treasury yields, mortgage rates, credit spreads, they're all higher. The dollar's appreciated and equity prices are lower. So, you know, if you look at inflation, though, it's unacceptably high. Um, and that persistent inflation and that high inflation is the key challenge facing our economy. Inflation rates still at 40 year highs. If you look at the PC inflation rate, which is what we, the Fed's goal is set measured by, measured year over year in September, um, PC inflation was still running over 6%. Core PCE was um, over 5% the median and trim mean measures so that we like, like to look at those because our goal is headline inflation, of course, but we like to look at these median and trim mean measures, um, which exclude components with the most extreme movements each month. They, they give you a better sense of where inflation is going, that underlying trend in, in inflation. And they tell a similar story of persistently high inflation. Now, there are some positive signs. One of them is that the three month changes in underlying inflation measures. So that's what I'm showing here. Um, they are lower now than they were in June. Um, although, you know, if you have to look at the level, the level is quite above where we, we need inflation to be. There's other positive signs. Commodity prices have moved down. Goods inflation has begun to ease. And then this morning we got the October CPI report. Um, which is another inflation measure that we look at, of course, and that suggests some easing in the overall core inflation measures. You know, the Cleveland Fed produces the median CPI series um, and the trim mean series, and they also confirm that there's been some easing um, in inflation last month. So that's the positive side. On the other hand, services inflation, which tends to be sticky, has not really shown signs of slowing. Um, and in addition, inflation continues to be broad based. So if you look at the September PCE inflation report, the prices of about half of the items that people buy were at least 5% higher than they were a year ago. And that share, we haven't seen much improvement in that share. So that's, that's an issue because if, if you think about inflation, it's really hard um, for people in lower income households who tend to spend a larger share of their income on essentials like food, shelter, and energy. And the double whammy there is that those components have also seen some of the largest price increases. So they're spending a larger share of their, of their uh, pocketbook on things that have seen very high inflation rates. Now- So Loretta, is it, it seems like the PCE inflation is always a little bit leading the other three measures. You have the core and the Cleveland Fed. Is it because of the energy prices primarily, or is it generally true that the PC inflation is leading the others? Well, we get the data on CPI first, and then we get PC inflation. But in terms of underlying trends, we like the PC inflation at the Fed as our, and we use that as our uh, inflation target because it's broader based. Um, it allows for substitutability as people buy different things. And so that's kind of why we want that to be 
our, our target. But we do look at all the other inflation measures because, again, they're all contain important signals about where underlying inflation is going. They do contain noise sometimes, right? So energy and food prices can be tend to be volatile. So that's why core measures we look at because it takes those out. And those trim mean and median measures that take out the, the components that have the biggest and lowest price increases every month, those are important information too. So again, it's a signal extraction problem. You have a bunch of data um, and you have anecdotal reports from businesses as well that we talk to routinely. That gives us a sense of where inflation is and where it's going. And as I said, right now, the levels are still very high. Some positive news in the most recent data, but nowhere near uh, what we need to see to really be confident that inflation is moving down back to 2%. So again, if we really want inflation to fall, and we do, in order for that to happen, there's going to be, need to be further slowing in both product and labor markets. And that will help bring demand in those markets into better balance with supply. And that'll help alleviate those price pressures we've been seeing. So we are beginning to see demand in product markets slowing. Um, if you look at um, the GDP report, um, you know, real output contracted in the first half of the year. We saw it grow again in the third quarter. But if you look at final sales to private domestic purchases, that was essentially flat. So that gives you a, a pretty good idea about domestic demand. Consumer spending slowed in the third quarter. Residential investment fell significantly. And of course, that really is reflective of the, the sharp increase in mortgage rates we've seen um, this year. Now, equipment spending grew at a pretty healthy pace, pace in the third quarter. Um, but if you look at, again, we have to look forward. We don't want to only look backwards. If you look at the new orders indexes from the ISM and um, the regional Fed manufacturing surveys, they indicate that equipment spending is likely to slow in coming months. So that shows that demand is slowing. On the supply side, um, there has been improvement in supplier delivery times and anecdotal reports from business contacts tell us that you know, there's, we're seeing some welcome easing in supply bottlenecks. They're still there and they're still challenging, but there has been some easing in those bottlenecks. So on balance, I do expect real GDP growth to be well below trend this year and next year. Now, there's also been some uh, slight, I would say, moderation in labor market conditions, but overall, the labor market remains tight. If you look at job gains, they've slowed to an average of about 290,000 per month over the past three months, compared to about 540,000 per month over the same period a year ago. And if you look at job openings, they are lower than they were in March. But still, we have almost two openings per unemployed persons. And if you go back to another period, 2019, we had very tight labor markets too. It was a strong labor market. That the current openings per unemployed person is a lot higher at almost two compared to 1.2 back in 2019. So again, another signal that this market is, the labor market's still tight. So even though we've seen slowing in output growth, um, business contacts are telling us something that is very interesting. One, they, they can't find workers they need. So even though growth is slowing, they continue to want to find more workers. Um, and you can see that the unemployment rate is at 3.7%. It's still very low by historical standards. And some of our um, businesses are really saying, like, even if growth continues to slow, we're going to try to hold on to our workers as long as we can, because it was just so difficult to find and to retain workers over the past two years. So that, that suggests that um, I, economists would call that labor hoarding. We might see firms keep more people on their payrolls um, as the economy slows. Now, another sign that labor demand is outpacing labor supply is the strong wage growth we're seeing. So if you look at the year over year growth rate of the employment cost index, um, that's 5%. Um, and that's well above the level consistent with um, price stability based on estimates of trend productivity growth. So Marcus, your question at the beginning of the poll was interesting to find out why or, you know, why does it seem that uh, 
what's going on in the labor market. Perhaps it's a permanent shock to productivity growth, perhaps just a temporary one. I mean, people like, I, I like to look at the three month changes um, because year over year, it's a good smooth series. But if you wanna see turning points, you can look at that. I know there was um, something made of the fact that the last data point, last quarter, it moved down. But I don't see that this is really saying that we're seeing much easing in, in wages yet. So, you know, my own view is that, you know, even though growth is slowing um, and there's some perhaps moderation in, in the strong labor market conditions, um, there continues to be upside risk to the inflation forecasts that we're facing. Um, the war, Russia's war against Ukraine um, is continuing. That can mean gas and energy prices move higher again this winter and next winter. Um, and I have to say, I, you know, it's hard to forget. I remain very aware of the fact that economists' forecasts, the private sector forecasts, the FOMC's forecasts as revealed in the SCP, the Summary of Economic Projections, and my own forecasts have been underestimating uh, the level of inflation and its persistent for almost two years. So again, you know, if I look at sort of where the balance of risks are, I think there's upside risk to the inflation forecast. Did, did you also look at the within the labor sectors? You know, the blue colors was white color workers. There's this white color recession coming up, and you see for a long time now, first time, a wage compression to some extent that actually. Low-income workers' wages go up more than high-income uh, workers? Yeah, Marcus, that's, that's, that's exactly crazy. right. Yeah, we did see that. Um, partly it's the nature of the pandemic shock, right? So the type of shock impacted different sectors. And then when the economy reopened, right, those sectors that were hard hit, like if you think about um, hospitality workers, right, when that demand came back, it was pent-up demand, and there was a, a real strong desire to get people back to work in those sectors that had lost a lot of workers. And so you saw the wages adjust. So you're right, we, you know, we, when we are doing the analysis, we do delve down um, and to look at those components. But overall, I would say that these wage data don't suggest to me that we're going to, that we're seeing anything on the wage side that suggests that the labor market isn't tight. I'd, I'd say this is confirming evidence that it's tight. So so again, I think there's upside risks to the inflation forecast, but despite the upside risk, I do think we're going to see inflation begin to slow meaningful next year um, and the following year, and then reach come, come back to our 2% goal in 2025. And that's because the FOMC really is strongly committed to returning the economy to price stability. So, you know, I titled the talk diligent. We're going to be diligent in making that happen. And that means we're going to proceed with care, but also be conscientious in doing that. Um, so one of the things that's helpful is um, the behavior of long, longer term inflation expectations. So the fact that those near term expectations have risen significantly with actual inflation, that's typically what you see. They have fallen in recent months. Um, because what also you see is that they move around a lot with saline prices like gasoline prices. Gasoline prices have come down. So near-term inflation expectations have come down, but they're quite a bit above our target. I mean, with all these measures. When you look at inflation expectations over the longer term, they've risen less, right? So they've been res less responsive to data. Um, and that, I think, reflects the FOMC's commitment, right? They, they, the credibility of our commitment to bringing inflation back down. So if you look at these measures, you know, there's, you know, some of the measures did go up, right, from lower levels seen, you know, pre-pandemic. So that is a concern. But they're reasonably well anchored at levels consistent with our goal. Um, and the, and the, why that's important is that that should help to lower inflation, Right. If we can keep those anchored, right, that helps lower inflation without as large of a slowdown in activity. So, you know, in despite this sort of reasonably well anchored, I don't think we should take anchoring for granted because the longer actual inflation and near term inflation expectations remain elevated, the greater the risk that longer term inflation expectations become an anchor. And that would mean that high inflation would really permeate wage and price setting behavior and investment decisions. And then in turn, that would make it much more costly to return to inflation to our goals. So it's really critical that we set our policy to maintain that, that anchoring 
of those inflation expectations. So, you know, we at the Fed started um, moving rates up expeditiously this year. Um, we started from a very accommodated stance of policy. Um, and now we're basically at the start of a stance that's becoming restrictive. So the focus when we were well below um, a neutral policy, you know, the focus had been on how quickly can we get to that neutral restrictive stance. Now the focus can shift to the appropriate level of restrictiveness that's going to return the economy to price stability in a timely way. And so, you know, given the current level of inflation and the fact that it's broad based and it's been persistent, I think we're going to need monetary policy is going to need to become more restrictive and remain restrictive for a while in order to put inflation on a sustainable downward path to 2%. So if you look at the FOMC statement last week, right, we say that in determining that pace of future increases, we're going to be taking into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy. You know, we recognize we've brought the funds rate up. Um, we're going to, of course, monetary policy acts on the broader economy with lag effects, um, both on activity and inflation. And also, to me, very important, right, economic and financial developments are important um, in our policy decisions because those factors figure into the economic outlook and the risk around the outlook, which inform our policy decisions. So, you know, precisely how much higher the Fed funds rate will need to go and for how long policy will need to remain restrictive are really going to depend on how much inflation and inflation expectations are moving down, which then depends on how much demand is slowing, um, how much supply challenges are being resolved, and price pressures are easing. So, you know, I'm going to be making that assessment assessment of how long and how high. I'm going to be looking at a variety of incoming information. I think sometimes people, when the Fed says, and I've been, I've used this, we're data dependent. Some people think that we only look at the official statistics, and they, of course, lag um, the economy. And 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 it seems like you'd always be sort of running behind. But when I say data dependent, I really look at a variety of information. So. It's information and data. So there's the official statistics. There's a lot of survey evidence. The Cleveland Fed runs our own um, inflation expectation surveys, which is very helpful. Very, you know, it's a weekly survey of indirect consumer um, inflation expectations, which has been helpful over this period. Um, and then we have a lot of business, labor market, and community contacts. They provide us with a lot of forward-looking information. And that, of course, um, is helpful in sort of assessing conditions and, and so setting appropriate policy. Somehow weighted, somehow, is it like the expectations is service from households or is it more the bond traders, you know, financial markets, forecasts of inflation? Yeah. How much I mean, weight do you put on this various? Yeah. Okay, so that's a really good question, Marcus. It's an open question. You know, some people have their favorite. Some people have other ones. I mean, I like to look at a lot of different indicators because again, the theory doesn't even suggest necessarily which inflation expectations matter. Um, and the measurement issues involved in some of these, right, suggest that you, you're better off at looking at a variety of measures and trying to extract the signal from those measures, understanding, caveating that, like for example, the New York Fed survey, right, this is a three year ahead, um, inflation surveys. This is a relatively new survey. So you have to take that into account too. The market expectations, so that's the blue line here. Um, this is five year, five year forward. Sometimes they're affected by things that are independent of um, inflation. Real rates can be affected by, you know, liquidity premium and other premiums. So you have to be, if there's market, you know, a lot of volatility in the markets, again, the signal extraction problem. So my own approach is I want to look at a variety of measures um, to inform my view. Um, and of course, you know, you can try to put these together. The, the uh, um, Board of Governors has this common inflation expectations index. Um, and that does exactly what we're talking about. It tries to extract the signal. Um, and so that's going to be a smoother series. So there's a, lot, a variety of techniques that can, you can use. But again, you know, I, this moving up um, when we saw inflation moving up is, was problematic because 
it moved up when inflation moved up. And then it started moving back down when gasoline prices started falling. And so to my mind, you know, if it's truly anchored, you would see less correlation with the data. Um, but the level certainly isn't, you know, I would say reasonably well anchored at our goal, but we got to not take that for granted and we got to do what we can do. Um, so the, the Fed is, is a business inflation expectation. So it's about the firm setting the right. prices, I guess. Exactly. And that yeah. moved down in the last um, quarter, right? But again, one quarter doesn't make it trend or whatever they say, right? So we have to, yes. again, it's positive that that moved down, but still, you know, we got to take that into consideration that you don't want to be too, given the, the cost of getting this wrong, you, you really need to, Mm -hmm. to look carefully at that so you know so in the in 1970s this... one of the mistakes was made that you know there was a lot of interest rate hikes in the 70s too but then you know when the economy cooled down immediately was withdrawn okay. did the fed learn some lessons from from the 1970s in this regard to say okay interest rate hike has to be more persistent in a sense well i think we have i mean if you look at sort of we'll go back to the statement language right i mean we think that we're going to need to raise rates from this point right so this isn't like looking at some data that show okay we're beginning to see some slowing in output and we're beginning to see perhaps some labor market numbers move down oh we're done i mean to my mind right the big lesson is you don't want to stop and go policy that gets you into a position where inflation expectations become unanchored. And I think we'll talk about later the flexible inflation targeting and the new, you know, the strategy document that was put out um, before the pandemic really um, underscores that anchoring of inflation expectations. And I think that's very much in everyone's mind um, at the FOMC to be very um, attentive to that um, because that just raises the cost of getting back to price stability. So in December, we're going to be putting out, um, the FOMC will put out new um, summary of economic projections. And basically, that's going to incorporate every participant's thinking about the appropriate path of policy. So, you know, this transaction, transition back to price stability, it's going to take some time. Um, and it's not going to be without some pain along the way. Um, you know, it's likely that we're going to continue to see higher than normal levels of financial market volatility, and that can be difficult to navigate. Um, growth, I think, is likely to be well below trend. I think it could easily turn negative for a time if they're depending on a shock hitting. Um, as I said earlier, business contacts are telling us that they, you know, plan to to keep workers even as the economy slows because it was just so difficult to attract and retain them over the last few years, but, um, and that would be a good thing in the sense that un the unemployment rate, mm -hmm. right, would not have to go up as much, but it's also possible that we will see unemployment, um, the unemployment rate go up more than anticipated, and then that would impose um, hardships on households and businesses. So there, there, are, there are, you know, people focus on those potential costs of this, you know, and difficulties in journey, but I think it's also really important to remember that the current very high inflation is painful as well. Um, you know, West well, well off people and, and um, businesses, they have to struggle to make ends, ends meet. Um, and that's very um, painful. You know, we hear that as a top concern of everyone we're talking to. Um, it used to be that, you know, you could be rationally inattentive to inflation. No one's rationally inattentive now, everyone's following it. Um, and I also think it's really important not to underestimate the consequences of continued elevating inflation on the long run health of the economy, right? It's, you know, the, some of the trade off between, you know, are we going to go into a slowdown versus how long do you want inflation to stay up? I think there's also long run implications of very high inflation. If you don't have price stability, basically businesses and households have to divert their attention to try to preserve their purchasing power of their money, that makes it difficult for them to plan for the future, makes it very hard to make long-term commitments. And I think that it really distorts the decisions people and businesses make regarding investment in physical and human capital, right? And then again, without price stability, we're not gonna be able to sustain healthy labor market conditions over the medium and longer run. And that really is inconsistent with the maximum employment part of the Fed's dual mandate. So, you know, 
I are there any service important. you look at saying, okay, people are rising short, is shortening because there's so much uncertainty, price stability is not there anymore. Oh, the, Hence, their decisions are much more short term. Yeah, that's definitely true. So, for example, if you look at some um, contracts, mm -hmm. right, the tenor of the contracts have changed, uh, have shortened. So, again, you know, that, and that's because on both sides, businesses thought, well, I, there's a lot of demand for higher wages at this moment. I think it'll cool or I'm hoping it'll cool. So I have an incentive to have shorten the horizon. And the workers are like, wow, I think inflation is going to go up a lot more in the next couple of years, perhaps. And I don't want to lock into a three-year contract. So we've seen that. And again, those kind of distortionary effects have an impact on the, you know, the longer run economy. I've had CEOs tell me um, that, you know, they've spent like over the last two years, it's been so hard to, hard to hire people that they have had to focus their attention on the labor force in their company mm -hmm. and not on innovating and not thinking of new products and new ways of doing business. That's a productivity hit, right? And that could have long run implications. So, you know, I, I think those kind of things are hard to quantify necessarily, mm -hmm. um, but I, it does, you know, give me a sense of, the, the fact that we have to prioritize getting the economy back to price stability. So while we're doing that, of course, we have to balance, right? Whenever there's a transition in monetary policy, we need to balance. We need to weigh the risk of tightening too much against the risk of tightening too little. So of course, if we tighten too much, um, we would slow the economy more than necessary and that would, it, basically impose more costs than needed. But if we were to tighten too little, and you alluded to this earlier, Marcus, you know, we'd be allowing high inflation to persist. Again, and that has short and long run consequences. It would necessitate a much more costly journey back to price stability. So we're gonna to need to be very diligent in setting monetary policy um, to get back to price stability. And we have to ju be judicious in balancing these risks so as to minimize the pain of the journey. So my own view- Can, can I ask about this average inflation targeting perhaps yeah. already now? Mm -hmm. You know, if you take it seriously, now we have this high inflation, we should actually have then below 2% inflation in order to get an average 2%. Or is this average inflation target an asymmetric rule? Whenever we undershoot, we make up for it. Whenever we overshoot, we ignore it. Yeah. Uh, how should I how should I read this average or flexible average inflation targeting? Right. Well, flexible is a good word in there. Um, sometimes it applies <laughs> but to the it fact that we have a dual mandate. No, I think as as uh, when when Chair Powell gave his speech where he rolled it out the new framework, he was very careful to say that we don't view this as a numerical averaging exercise. Right. It was an exercise of. You know, we want to get back so that we, it, it was basically saying, look, we're not going to take one reading as sort of being we're at price stability. We're going to try to keep inflation, right, near 2%, right, and not allow it to go too much above and too much below. But we do have a dual mandate. So there are going to be periods where perhaps it's the labor market that gets more attention than, the, than price stability. But price stability has to come first in the sense that if we really don't have price stability, we cannot have a strong labor market. I mean, they don't go together. So again, the current environment is one in which, you know, we really have to be focused on this inflation um, part of our mandate because it is a precursor to having sustainably good, healthy labor market conditions. So that's how I see the two pieces fitting but together. Is it, but now. is it like if you were to undershoot below 2% accidentally because it was happened to be too tight, is it a problem or is saying, oh, that would fit in the average inflation target? Well, you know, it, it, again, it depends, right? So we wouldn't want inflation to run persistently below 2%. Mm -hmm. We saw that, right, in the period before the pandemic, right? Inflation was actually too low. Um, and, you know, if you think about the, the financial crisis, I mean, one of the puzzles back then when, you know, we were in that deep um, recession, the Great Recession was, wow, inflation didn't fall as much as people thought it would. And that pointed out the very important role that these longer term inflation expectations remaining well anchored helped us, right? Because it basically kept inflation, you know, the public businesses believed that we would get back um, to 2% because they knew we were going to act. 
you know, now we have the opposite situation. We have a potential that high inflation and high near-term inflation expectations, right, could be detrimental to that anchoring. And so that, that's why we have to take this very seriously. But I don't think you should view this as a numerical um, mm -hmm. that we have to offset every, you know, time we go a little above by a time we go a little below. I, that isn't kind of the way I view it. I think it's more giving us the ability over time to bring inflation down and keep it at 2% reasonably measured in terms of our PCE target. You know, the other thing I, I have to say in your poll, I guess I would have phrased the question a little bit differently because you almost made it sound like our goal has changed with the flexible inflate, average inflation target. And I didn't, I never viewed it that way. We took 2% as our long-term inflation goal before we even started, you know, looking at the strategy for getting there. And in that strategy, the, the, the consensus view was that if we do an average inflation targeting, you know, methodology, that'll get us um, that's a more effective way of getting to price stability. But of course, there's going to be a lot of, I think, discussion about that. I mean, there's probably PhD dissertations being written at Princeton right now that are going to ask the question about what role did the new strategy have um, in the current episode. But so far, I think that strategy is, is still serving us well. Um, mm -hmm. And I certainly think that we're very committed to 2% as our goal for longer term inflation. So, you know, getting back to sort of like this risk management, um, you know, tightening too little, weighing that against tightening too much. My own view um, is that despite the fact that we've moved the funds rate up um, this year, just based on the consistent, you know, um, the consistency the, that our, uh, and our forecasts have been um, really, underestimating the, 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 both the persistence and the level of inflation. Um, and then added on to that, the fact that there are significant costs of high inflation continuing. I, I currently view that the larger risks come from tightening too little mm -hmm. um, at this point. Um, but you know, as policy moves further into restrictive territory um, and stays there for some time, the effects of that cumulative tightening are going to work through the broader economy. And I, I do anticipate that I, we're going to see inflation pressures ease. And at that point, I expect that my view of the balance of the risk will shift too. Um, and I actually will welcome that because when that happens, that means that we've seen inflation moving down in a meaningful way. So that kind of is where I am on the prepared remarks. Um, mm -hmm. Marcus, so I, I'm going to stop sharing the slides so and then maybe we can discuss. We can talk a little bit more about this lag of monetary policy. You know, it. You know, Milton Friedman was yeah. talking a lot about this right. lag, but more recent voices out of the Fed said the lag's got shorter because we have no better information. Do you have a take on, on you know, how variable these lags are and how long they are? What, you know, how yeah. should okay. we think it's of a lags? really Yeah, it's a really good question, Marcus. I think the other thing in that question, though, and why there is this sort of, um, sort of view that, wow, things move fast. I think where you measure the start of the tightening matter. So yes, the FOMC raised, it wasn't until March of this year that we raised the target range of the funds rate. Mm -hmm. But you know, perhaps the way to think about um, the start was when we sort of pivoted our communications. And we pivoted the communications back, you know, starting probably in September, uh, definitely December, right? When we really started talking about the fact that, you know, we're getting to a point where we're going to have to, you know, move off, remove accommodation. So again, partly I think it is that we do communicate very differently now than we used to, right? And that could contribute to, to some of it. Partly is because the financial markets did react strongly. Like mortgage rates went up very significantly, right? They're above 7% um, once we started tightening. But also some of the action happened before we even raised the funds rate in March. So again, um, you know, we've started to see some of the impact. I mean, the way I read it is we've done, you know, tightening, you know, we're basically at, I think, right at the beginning of restrictive. And we still have inflation running well, well above our goal. So that just to me says we, it, we need to do more. Mm 
And, and we will, you know, we indicated that, you know, we think ongoing increases are necessary. And, you know, now it's a question of, okay, let's look at incoming information, right? Forward looking information, um, as well as the statistical information we get from the official reports um, and then sort of gauge that, right? But my own view is that you want to be very convinced that inflation is on a sustainable downward path to 2%. Because the cost of not being, you know, the cost of, of, of um, you know, retreating too quickly, I think are much, are greater, right? And it's because of the short run costs, it's great, but also these longer run costs, because once, you know, if, if inflation expectations get unanchored, if inflation moves down, you know, for a month and you stop, but then it moves back up, you're in a worse position and, and it's a more costly journey then and no one wants to impose more costs um, than necessary to do this um, so we recognize or i recognize there are costs to doing what we're doing but i think there's cost much greater costs of not doing what we're going to do if that makes sense so i see that the risk management approach really says you should actually do more now otherwise there might be if you happen right. to have done too little subsequently the costs right. will be much more dramatic but i have another, another question you know according to the taylor principle you should raise the nominal interest rate more than the uh, inflation increases and that the real rate has to go up and the question is at what maturity to look at you know right. you can look at the short end or right. some little bit out in the yield curve and then right. it depends very much what inflation expectations you oh. look at Exactly. Do you have any favorite number in this, yeah. uh, or is there anything uh, the FOMC says? Okay, we look at you know two years out, and that's right. what we do, or yeah. three years out, or how do you apply this Taylor principle? At what rate do you apply it? Yeah, I mean it's it's a good question. I think you have to look at more than just the funds rate because the funds rate is the overnight rate, mm -hmm. but that's sort of the policy rate that we need to use as sort of the anchor. And the reason I think we're basically just beginning to be restrictive is because if you take that rate. And you use like one year ahead inflation expectations. We're about maybe where you know if you, I was looking at sort of like SEP, take the median SEP mm. inflation prediction for the next year, three and a half percent. Or mine was three and a half percent. I was a little mm. bit above theirs. You're basically right now starting to be restrictive, but you do want to look at more than just an overnight interest rate because these other interest rates affect economic activity. Right. So, you know, a short run, short interest rates, you want to look at those. And if you look at sort of the yield curve, right, real rates are, you know, in positive territory, you know, for the first time. But again, just the fact that we have been, you know, moving off of a, a very, very, very accommodative stance, we just have to keep going to make sure that we're doing enough get inflation back down. And inflation hasn't, I mean, yes, there was some positive news today and there's some positives in some of the readings of inflation. So that's very good. Um, but again, we're going to have to just bring their funds rate up some more to make sure that we get that sustainably coming down. Um, and and I think that's- the rate of between moving the interest rate versus shrinking your balance sheet, like quantitative tightening, the emphasis is very much on the interest rate policy. I guess you just Correct. just get run off the balance sheet rather than actively selling off. Uh, right. I mean, we have more experience, of course, with the policy rate. Right. We yeah. we and, and as much as we've just been talking about the uncertainties around monetary policy, there's lags and where do you count when you start policy because of the communications. There's even much more uncertainty about sort of the taking a balance sheet shrinkage how much does that impact the real economy how much does that in, in inflation so the strategy was right let's pick something that seems like a reasonable pace of runoff and it is much quicker than the last time we did it but we learned some things in the last time mm -hmm. right and allow it to to sort of run i would call it passively it does have an effect on the economy it is it is affecting it is a, another way of tightening policy but the main action is with the policy rate because we understand it more than we do the, the thing. No but we are attentive to the balance sheet runoff, mm -hmm. right? And if that, you know, but then we use our policy rate, right, as, our, as, as the rate of the act of one. So if balance sheet runoff is having a, 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 you know, a good effect on helping inflation to come down, right, that means we might have to do less work with the interest rate tool. 
right? But we can allow that to happen and then use our interest rate tool, right? Depending on what we see in the economy. It also depends a little bit whether you want to affect the short end of the yield curve or the intermediate or long end of the yield curve. With the balance sheet movements, you can affect the long end of the yield curve more, but you can also affect it through communication about future short Right. Terms. I mean, so if you think back to... Um, Think back to the financial crisis when we use quantitative easing, right? That we were on, we were operating in the long end, right? Yes. We had brought the funds rate down. We wanted to bring long rates down. This time when we went in and started buying treasuries and MBS, remember it was in March, 2020. That wasn't about monetary policy. That was about financial stability and the functioning, right? Of the treasury market, right? So we bought across, you know, the curve. So again, you know, one of the things I think is not as well understood, and I, I think our communications weren't as clear, is, you know, we bought in the beginning those assets not as a monetary policy option, but really as we had to restore market functioning. And then later on, once the funds rate had hit zero and the pandemic was in full fledge, and there was a lot of uncertainty about how deep it would be. And if you remember back, there was a lot of thought, really dire scenarios, right, then we started using that as a tool of, of monetary policy, but we weren't as clear about that, as, in my opinion, as maybe we should have been. About that so let me come back to the inflation anchor, because, you know, I also am worried about the inflation anchor, so it's very important to, to make sure that it holds. But there's a tension there. So first of all, there's a tension that if I look at core inflation, it's typically is considered as a better predictor of future inflation. But if I look at what anchors at least households expectations are the non-core products like energy and food. So it's a little bit of a tension. It seems like if I do inflation prediction, the usual way, in the usual business way, I should look at you know, all the inflation numbers except for energy and food. But if I worry about people be getting scared and don't believe in the inflation numbers and getting de-anchored, I should actually look at the energy and food aspects. So how do you deal with this tension uh, in a sense? Or you, the alternative would be to say, we focus more on the bond traders and the firms rather than the households who have particular focus on energy. And, and I mean, that's these are really important research questions, Marcus. I mean, we have an inflation research center here at the Cleveland mm -hmm. Fed, and that's one of the things that they look at is like which whose inflation expectations matter right for the health of the economy and you know if you think about is, is, is it wage bargaining with firms and maybe it's the business inflation expectations right or the are the salient thing if it's maybe it's financial markets as you saw right that that measure so again and maybe it's you know professional forecasters because in some models they actually do better in terms of sort of the prediction of where where long run inflation i think the important thing is that it's probably a longer run medium longer run that gives you some information about how credible right the public thinks the fed's commitment to price stability is right so it's important to look at those because that gives you some separate information, right? The short run measures, you're exactly right. There are these sailing in prices, food, right? It used to be milk prices were the key yes. ones, although maybe it's almond milk now if everyone's buying different kinds of milk. But anyway, there's too many different kinds of milks now. <laughs> um, and gasoline prices for sure just seem to figure into people's expectations. But then the question is, well, how much does that matter for the economy and where the inflation readings are going to go. And I think there's a good reason to think that we should be looking at those for sure, but because they might lead to longer run inflation expectations moving up and that it would be a very um, bad situation to be in. You also look at the, like the tail events, like, you know, if you look at options, like inflation swaps and options, you can actually figure out how likely it is that, you know, right. we reach a tail event of an inflation increase. Yeah. And also, the, the, if you look at, we have survey evidence, of course, you can look at the dispersion, right, in the survey responses, which I think is, again, reflective of how anchored are things, right? So if you think about, like, um, the mean as opposed to the median in those surveys, right, that can move around quite a bit, depending on what happens in those tails. Um, and so those, those indicate... I mean, one thing was very interesting is that 
we saw sort of this in the beginning, you know, when inflation started moving up, it was the median, the inflation expectations moved up, but it was mainly on the, there was a lot of weight on the tail, the positive mm-hmm. tail. Now you're seeing some weight in the negative tail. Um, and I think the New York Fed has done research that's just, you know, one theory was, well, that's because people think the economy is really going to tank. The New York Fed's recent research says, no, they're actually thinking that things are pretty positive and inflation is going to come down. It's just that maybe they don't understand the Fed has a 2% target. And so they're just putting a low number in there. So again, these are really hard research questions, Marcus. There's not a lot of work, but we're, we're doing a lot of work here in Cleveland to, to get a better handle on sort of that those questions that you're asking. And uh, coming back to the labor market, so one, one thing which is striking, you have shown that uh, how tight the labor market is. You know, and, and on the other hand, you know, GDP is, is not growing so well. So it, it's more the labor market than the right. overall economy. So how, what do you make uh, out of this? Do you think it's a long-term shock in workers' preferences? Uh, you know, it's like we have just want to work from home and they want to work essentially in a different way, might be less productive or be even more productive. We haven't figured it out yet. And how would you, how does this affect monetary policy? Do you see, okay, that's, you know, we have a different way. It might be the case that productivity is lower for now, but that would take into account in, in your FOMC meetings as well. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I separate out some of this into there are like short run things happening, mm-hmm. cyclical perhaps things, and then structural. So I think the shift in preferences, I think that's going to be a longer run. You know, I, I don't see everyone waking up tomorrow and saying, OK, now let's go back into the office. We certainly don't see mm-hmm. there's like and different people have different preferences. You know, when we all started coming back in the office, we had some some of us who love being here, who wanted to be in the office and other mm-hmm. workers who said, you know, I'd rather, you know, spend more time at home working there. So I think each individual has their own preferences. Of course, you got to aggregate up when you're thinking about what's the implications for um, the U.S. economy. So I think that, you know, that's a longer run issue and that will have implications for the level of interest rates, for example, um, R star, you know, that, that, but there are also short run issues about, okay, are we, do we really think, so if you look at labor force participation now, um, it's still, if total, you know, for the total, right, it's still below pre-pandemic levels. Okay, if you look at, bit, no? well, no, if you look at prime age, Okay. Right. That one is basically on trend. Yeah. Right. So the question is, well, are you going to see? And what happened was a lot of people retired, right, during the pandemic. So one question was, or are they going to come back into the labor market? So one school of thought is we will see them because of the stock market. You know, they were relying on stock market earnings, right? Their income has taken a hit and they'll come back. But the other school of thought is, and I think the evidence suggests this is true, is once you start taking Social Security, you don't typically come back into the labor force. So for, on a short run, where we are now in terms of, do you expect the balancing in the labor market to come from the demand side or the supply side? I think the work has to be done on the demand side. Mm-hmm. Right? And so, you know, whether that's, and we've started to see job openings are coming down. So firms have already recalibrated. Oh, okay, I don't, I, I thought I was gonna have this much activity economy may be slowing. I don't need as many workers. That's already starting to happen. And you do see that. But nonetheless, it still looks like demand in the labor market is outpacing supply, which again feeds into, okay, we're going to have to bring the funds rate up a bit more, you know, move further into restrictive territory. Um, again, to try to ease, right, the disparity between demand or the imbalance between demand and supply, both in the product side of the markets and in the labor market. So I would like to go to another topic beyond the labor market, which is like a fiscal monetary interaction, also financial uh, interaction. So one has the impression, you know, before the increase in the inflation, among policymakers, there was a sense we can do modern monetary theory, we can just spend whatever we want without impacting inflation. And do you think uh, this mentality has changed among the policymakers, and does the central banks do they have to do something for going back to uh, a different mentality? 
Do you also think that the Inflation Reduction Act had some impact? Does it impact what how the Fed is reacting because that all the Inflation Reduction Act will do the job for you? Or is it something which you think has not really an impact on the inflation? And then there's an issue about fiscal monetary. You saw the fiscal monetary dominance and financial dominance playing out in the United Kingdom recently, where essentially there was a battle going on between the UK Treasury and uh, and the Bank of England and also the, the pension funds, uh, how, how to deal with these circumstances. And you saw the, the interest rate exploding on the guilt, on the long-term guilt and financial stability issues popping up. Did this, you know, this episode in the United Kingdom, does it also raise some issues for the United States and has it woken up certain policymakers or even the Fed saying, okay, we have to be more careful about such episodes and this will actually make people more uh, reluctant to expand and, and spend in, on the fiscal side or be more prudent on the fiscal side as well. Do, do you see any interaction on these dimensions? So that, there's a lot packed into that, that question. So firstly, I don't think many policymakers that I talked to had bought into the MMT mm -hmm. um, thinking, as you put on the slide. So, uh, so again, yes, there are some policymakers who obviously did because that's why it became part of the news story. But I don't think we, I certainly did, and I don't think many of my Fed colleagues um, that I talked to quite a bit really I was bought into more for thinking. members of Congress and. Uh... On the fiscal yeah. side, yeah. So the, yeah, there may have been in the fiscal side, but I we've always been focused on making sure that we're going to be at two percent long run inflation goal and and calibrating our monetary policy to get there. So I, I don't and, and the way you kind of approach have to approach it is of course fiscal policy has implications for the economic outlook. Right, it has implications for GDP growth. It has implications for perhaps the labor market, depending on what the form that the fiscal policy takes. So you have to take it into account, right, when you're setting monetary policy because it has an implication for the current and future economic conditions. And of course, that then implies that okay, once you know kind of the outlook and the risk around the outlook, then you calibrate your monetary policy for it. So that's kind of how I think about it. You have to take into account what's going on on the fiscal side in order to run monetary policy because you know, that influences um, the economy and your outlook for the economy mm -hmm. and the risks around that outlook. So in that sense, you know, there, we're in a, we take that as sort of part of the economic environment. Similarly, the way we take some of the things going on in other countries, right? We don't ignore them, right? Because they do influence the outlook for the U.S. economy. And then we set our policy to achieve the goals, right? That are domestic goals, right? Price stability, maximum employment. In terms of what happened in the U.K., I mean, I take that as a cautionary tale in the sense that, um, markets have been extremely volatile, right? I thought that I have to give credit um, to, to, that, to the central bank in the sense that I thought they did a very good job of explaining that they were doing their action for fiscal, but for, uh, sorry, for financial stability reasons, not for monetary policy meaning. And Andrew Bailey, you know, explained that as, as well as Cliff and the others, you know, that this was a financial stability action and not a monetary policy action. So I think that was a very um, difficult challenge. And they, I think they pulled that off very well in terms of being able to explain why they had to do what they did. But it does give you sort of, you know, one of the things that the financial stability report that the Board of Governors put out um, earlier this week, I think, came out, um, maybe Monday or Tuesday, was, um, you know, there are some structural issues, right, that we've known about for a while in, like, the treasury market and other markets, um, and so we should really address those, because, you know, if there's a shock, and, you know, you could say, like, the shock in the UK was that very, very sharp, um, quick increase in the guilt rate yield, Right, mm -hmm. that can precipitate right things that be, could become mm -hmm. right market dysfunction that become could become a financial stability issue. So I take those very um, seriously, and 
you know, I think a number of us are, you know, really trying to make sure that we're monitoring those situations. I mean, the other thing that was also a, a cautionary tale there is that, you know, it, le hidden leverage, right? And Marcus, this is, you know, this better than anyone, right? Is really the source of a lot of these instabilities, right? And, you know, the fact that we, there are parts of our financial system where we don't have as much insight as we do into, as we do to like the regulated banking, mm -hmm. traditional personal banking service. And that, you know, we're doing the best we can do to monitor those situations. Perhaps we can spend another two minutes on another topic, which you touched upon already, the international impact of US monetary policy. You know, do you have any, is, are there any models at the Fed or anywhere we say, okay, what are the spillovers of US monetary policy on other countries? And then the spillbacks, I mean, by your mandate, I guess you can only take into account the spillbacks, but can we quantify somehow how big the spillbacks are? And the implications, you know, the dollar was appreciating quite a lot, 20%, 30%. Um, what are the implications of that? And uh, to what extent it also feeds in, in monetary policy? And of course, there's, of course, as we touched on the UK already, but there's also in Bank of Japan, as you know, as the yield curve control, it might be at some point, if they want to get out of it, to exit from this yield curve control, where you control the 10-year interest rate. Uh, if you want to exit from that, it might also lead to some discontinuous uh, adjustments. What are the implications then uh, coming back to the United States? And are you, you know, how would you react to that? Or is there contingency plans uh, ready for that? And so that's, I think, another... Uh, open perhaps you can spend just one or two minutes on this. I know that you have to leave soon. I mean, there's, it's definitely the case that when we're doing our own modeling in the Fed, right, and which is a, a, one of the foundational things that we do to help us set monetary policy, the models have, right, an international, right, mm -hmm. section, right? The models have sort of foreign economies in them. And I would, would suggest anyone who's very interested is I, we, we uh, post old Teal books, right? The, the policy document that really goes through the staff's forecast. Um, they're on the Board of Governors website, right? And if you look in those documents, you'll see that there's a large section that just covers the international um, environment because it is very important when we're setting US monetary policy to understand what's happening in um, other countries with their monetary policy, as you suggest, um, but also, you know, what are the economic conditions there, right? So you know, there's channels through our financial markets, but there's also a trade channel, um, not as big as other countries, perhaps, because, you know, um, it's a smaller part of our economy, other, you know, economies, it's a much bigger sector, but there's certainly, we certainly don't think of ourselves as, as an island, um, separate from other countries. We're in a global economy and we have to take into account, right, not only how our, our monetary policy is going to affect their economy, which then comes back and affects our economy. So again, it's general equilibrium, what view, right, that you have to sort of, sort of use that lens. Um, how well we do that in terms of the empirics, um, I think those are hard models. Um, to get precisely right, but it's true that, you know, we do look at those things and consider um, them, but through the lens of what do those developments abroad mean for the U.S. economy? Okay, I think uh, that's all the time we have. Uh, we are very grateful to you for all the enlightenment you gave us and make clear, a clearer, give us a clearer picture how monetary policy will or is and what the objectives of current monetary policy is. I'm also very grateful for all the questions you asked uh, in the Q&A box. So thanks a lot for the audience. And hope to see you soon uh, for our next webinar with uh, Martin Wolf from Financial Times. He talks, we will talk more about the United Kingdom and uh, Great Britain. Thanks again, Loretta, and hope to see you soon. And thanks everybody. Hope to you steer the ship very well and bring inflation down again. Thanks again. Thanks, Marcus.